welcome back, my brethren, to part two of my meandering discussion of Sons of the Forest, the world-class sandbox Jeffrey Dahmer simulator, a game that combines two of my favourite activities. One, not being able to play the guitar, and two, getting frustrated and hitting people with the guitar. This game clearly has all its bases covered. So what is my overall take on Sons of the Forest? Well, it's the most fun I've had in a survival game with building mechanics since Valheim. I shit you not. I think this game does a superb job of combining survival mechanics, base building mechanics, environmental storytelling, atmospheric game design. This is all facilitated by the abundance of game setting options, and it's all mixed together in a cup made from a human skull and smeared across the canvas of the island which effectively serves as both your prison and as a sandbox for the player, as you get more tools, learn more building skills and start getting creative. A word of caution about this game, some people will find it to be a bit of a slow burner. Personally, my first impressions of this game were a bit weak actually, and despite loving the game now, initially I wondered what exactly I'd gotten myself involved with. I face planted into this game on standard normal difficulty with no settings changed. I had several false starts where I was building crappy houses, getting constantly attacked and practically being boxed in and locked down in position. Then I had a go at peaceful mode, but that was too pedestrian even by my standards. Basically, nothing attacks you unless you're in a cave or a bunker. Out in the open world you're completely safe. I did learn a bit more about base construction and defences, but it all seemed a bit pointless given that there was nobody to defend against. Then I stumbled across a brilliant little video about difficulty settings and how important they are. So I set it on normal, turned off damage to buildings, tuned down the enemy strength and got to work. Then the game eventually became fun, really good fun, and it all started to click. Once I got to grips with how it all worked, and they had released the full game, I started a fresh playthrough on normal, with relootable boxes set to on, base damage turned off, longer seasons, and no other modifiers. Maybe at some point in the future I might give the whole 100% survival mode a try, but frankly, that looks a bit severe even by my survival mode standards. It is worth noting that you can only save at a shelter or bed. Now, after being dumped in one of the three random starting areas, you find a Mylar space blanket in the kit, and you can use this to make an improvised shelter with a couple of sticks, ergo, a mobile save point. Very handy in many circumstances, and it can even be used in some inside locations. But yes, you are bed hopping in this game, and since you really need to be smart about when you save and where you sleep, this is a key and central dynamic of your game. The survival mechanics are pretty decent actually. All the old staples such as emergency blankets, flares, knives, survival hatchets, MREs, etc, etc. They did a reasonably good job on this and clearly spent some quality time watching some survival and prepping videos. Who knows, maybe one of the devs is a legit survivalist, but I was actually quite impressed that they seem to know about this stuff unlike some games which are ludicrously out of touch. I did think the complete absence of cordage or string was a bit odd, the melee damage from the hatchet and cookery were vastly too low, and the MRE seemed to only contain one sachet of food, but overall it's not jarring and sometimes it's great. Dotted around the map are build recipes for a variety of things like furniture and base defences, Personally, I did find myself cheating and looking at an online map and doing little sorties around to places if I noticed something interesting, but now I'm starting fresh, I'm trying my hardest to rely solely on the in-game GPS. The island, on occasions where you find a particularly nice spot, can be incredibly stunning to look at. Some areas are so beautiful I ended up building a base with large open windows just to enjoy the view of the sunset, whilst I ate someone's forearm. What can I say? I'm a romantic at heart. 
There is no sidestepping the issue of the game's general levels of casual ultra-violence and sheer brutality. This game is uncompromisingly violent, graphic and visceral. I had a mighty chuckle the first time I hacked someone's arm off with an axe only to discover that it was a food item. As I said, people have got community strikes for showing uncensored footage of some of the violence. This game is jump scary as all shit. Not gonna lie, the first time I went down and explored a cave, it was a terrifying experience. I am a massive pussy when I play horror games, and I will admit that Sons of the Forest has given me plenty of frights, where I literally jumped out of my skin so badly that my hands lost their position on the keyboard, and I had to quickly scramble to find the right keys again. If you're looking for a relaxed video game to help work on your anxiety disorder, then this possibly might not be it. Then again, if you find killing and building log cabins relaxing, who knows what kind of experience it will be for you. The extensive options to fine tune the difficulty settings is superb. Judge me if you will, but right now I am playing with base damage turned off simply because I found the constant base repair tiresome. Seriously, at one point I found myself being constantly attacked by cannibals, and half of my day seemed to involve me running up and down the wall, playing whack-a-mole with the repair hammer. It just wasn't my bag. Maybe I might turn it back on at some point and see how I fare now my base defences are better, but honestly, it just seemed a bit daft that cannibals could weaken a log stake defensive wall by just shoulder barging it. I've seen people fail whilst trying to kick through an internal partition door during an emergency, but these guys could work for the fire brigade because they can literally bust up a stone wall with a bit of elbow grease and determination. As someone who's played a few survival games, loves to turtle and loves base building, I quickly found my niche in this game. I really enjoyed the leisurely cycle of slowly expanding out across the island, building a little network of cannibal safe spaces, so I could safely and quickly move point to point, knowing I would not be stuck out in the horrors of the forest for too long, never get stuck outside alone at night, and remain secure in the knowledge that a cosy fireplace, some supplies, and a really shitty bed was never that far away. Some players can tear through this game, almost permanently on the move, rarely building or taking pause, but personally, I enjoy turtling my way across the island at a leisurely pace, dominating it from the vantage point of my defensive towers. A tower defence, if you will. This said, someone once accused me of playing Call of Duty multiplayer like I was playing a tower defence game, so it was fairly predictable that I would be hardcore turtling in this game. The pan is mightier than the sword. One aspect of the game which I thought showed a bit of game design finesse is that some of the items with the highest utility are not weapons. Like any good survival game, your ammo supplies matter, and you need to make every bullet count. Basically, you can't just solve all of your problems by shooting them. But more than that, lots of seemingly innocuous items end up giving the player vast utility. Finding a pan lets you boil water, carry more water on your person, and cook up meals. The water bottle obviously extends the amount of water you can carry. Combine these two and you've literally got enough water storage so that you can spend a good few days in a location with no running water. The flashlight is obviously a lifesaver. Rope, just simple rope, which is used for so many useful constructions, but most importantly, it allows you to install emergency access points to enter your base from the water or to shimmy up your tower when you're being chased. The high utility of your companions is not to be underestimated, even if one has the IQ of a fucking doorstop and the other one spends most of her time having a case of the zoomies whilst running around in her fucking pants. If you keep Kelvin collecting stuff, this lets you two-tier your build projects. Quickly chop down some trees and set Kelvin to work collecting them. You can build some fish traps, etc. And when the logs are collected, you can set Kelvin to collect replacement sticks whilst you build your 
Wrangler Star-esque Love Palace. He is, despite his barely measurable IQ and occasional bugginess, invaluable. Virginia is essentially your sentry and you can equip her with weapons. This eventually makes her a devastating foe, especially since she's a mutant with three arms, so she can simultaneously use the shotgun and the 9mm pistol. Frankly, you're better off giving them to her, especially since she requires no ammo top-ups. Combined, you essentially form a troublesome trio. Kelvin is your free labour and Virginia is your personal bodyguard. Now add to this that combined, they function as a kind of passive and active detection system. Sometimes the first sign of trouble you notice is Kelvin pointing or running for his life, or Virginia squealing or shooting into the bushes. I shit you not, surviving the forest is much more fun as a team effort. As I said, the base building does have its foibles and when I first started it seemed pretty basic to me. But you can go on to build some quite sophisticated structures, with a bit of practice and probably a few YouTube guides. But it doesn't really hold your hand, and it's not especially forgiving. This said, with a bit of work and a little research, you will quickly find yourself making your dream log cabin, fully decked out with deerskin carpets, the severed heads of your vanquished foes, and furniture made out of human skulls. The decor choices in this game are a bit like what you would expect if HP Lovecraft got hired to run IKEA. My real gripe with the building mechanics, fun as they are, is this. It really can get very complicated doing certain specific tasks. It should be easy, because obviously players will want to do them. E.g. internal stairs. Similarly, the finagling required can be a real ball ache. Now this compounds with the phenomenon of accidentally pulling out the wrong log, where in certain specific scenarios it can never be reinserted, sometimes requiring an entire teardown of a whole section of your house just to get back to that precise point where you needed to put the log back in. I've done this too many times to count, and it is not funny. When you're building two sets of internal stairs in your little medieval doll's house, you pull out the wrong log at the wrong time, and now you can't insert the stair battens. It's pretty frustrating that you have to condemn the entire building project and start over. There are also some ongoing issues with the roof structures. Basically, flat roofs work, prefab structures with slanted roofs work, but other manifestations of sloped roof seem to be screwed. In a nutshell, sometimes the game doesn't know if you are sheltered or not in winter, so you will be cold even when you're inside. The prefabs seem to be fine, but it can get a bit annoying trying to figure out exactly what isn't working when you're building your own structure. But as a general rule, sloped roofs don't seem to offer proper shelter, and sometimes gaps in the floors above can affect your shelter on the floor below. I don't fully understand what is going wrong here. All I know is that other people have spoken about it and I've experienced it. You will know what I'm talking about when you suddenly build your lovely little mountain log cabin and, and realise you're still freezing to death the second you walk more than two metres away from the fire. One of the beautiful things about this game is that I am still learning new stuff as I'm playing. I will concede though that this is a double-edged sword because it happens in part because this game has zero hand-holding. You get your little tutorial book on the basics, and then the game fucks you off into a hellscape that makes John Carpenter's 1982 movie The Thing seem like a friendly holiday camp by comparison. But yes, after hundreds of days in the forest, I'm still working out or discovering new tricks, such as I didn't realise I could fill my pot and canteen directly from my water collectors, bypassing some fuckery and significantly reducing the amount of toxic waste in the water. Similarly, you can build certain traps inside caves, along with stationary torches. You will thank me for that tip later. This game has in-game player transport. How cool is that? Pretty shocking, really, when you consider it. Todd, I'm normally much taller than this Howard, couldn't launch Starfield with player transport, yet somehow a small, independent studio could model a massive island, not procedurally generate a damn thing, make all locations unique and interesting, 
and provide the player with hang gliders, electric unicycles, and bloody solar powered golf carts to help you get around, and retrofit them with GPS and a sound system. How does that work out, Todd? Personally, I really enjoyed the golf carts. It gave me that whole silent running vibe, but I'm a sucker for retro sci-fi. I like games that make me think about stuff from real life and particularly history, and this game is a really good example. One quite bizarre and interesting aspect of this game was that it really made me appreciate the practice of working high steel. I'm not actually kidding here, but once I started getting into the practice of building large tower structures, I suddenly appreciated the value of hard working men who would just shimmy up the building with ropes and build your structure without the need for external scaffolding, walkways and modern machinery. I salute them. Similarly, playing this game made me fully appreciate some of the dynamics and practices of early American settlements. And I'm talking Roanoke here, not so much Boston. When you're in a strange and hostile land full of terrifying and odd looking locals, there are dangers all around you and at any moment some rando with face paint on might jump out of a raspberry bush and crack open your noggin with a stone club because in his infinite wisdom he thinks your severed head might make a nice table ornament, then it makes complete sense that a lot of early settlements were built like wooden fortresses and they adopted the martial doctrine of inside good, outside bad. You can appreciate why they cleared out all the trees and undergrowth around the walls so they could see anyone approaching. You can see why they hung torches on the outside of the wall to light up the perimeter at night. When you live in an environment where anything beyond the tree line is potentially lethal, you're going to build your home like it's a damn fortress. Because basically it is. Talking of American settlers and the colonies, I'm actually waiting for some snowflake at Kotaku, IGN or Reset Era to start whining about this game. Specifically, I'm waiting for some blue haired tart, soy boy cuck or some manner of strange beast in between to fabricate some kind of treaties where they position this game as being an analogue of colonialism in America and spin some fanciful yarn about the cannibal tribes being a metaphor of indigenous peoples, having their land appropriated by the player protagonist who represents the colonising and civilising forces of Western modernism. <laughs> I guess it is a bit, but it's fun smacking these ingrates in the head with a cookery and then taking control of their land. And yes, FY fucking I, that is a tactical cookery, very similar to the Condor Tool and Knife tactical cookery. It is not a machete bloody heathens. So yes, who gives a shit if there are vague colonial parallels in this game because it's fun, it's just a game and besides, there were two sides to colonialism in North America and whilst I'm frankly sympathetic to the plight of the North American Indians as a whole and the innumerable injustices that they have endured, let's not forget that some of them were absolute fucking clowns. One Indian chief traded his land for some shitty blankets and glass baubles because he thought the land could not be bought or owned by an individual, so he had tricked the white man. Not so fast, Cochise. Pretty sure you got screwed on that trade. Just imagine that guy getting home after a hard day at the office, murdering the neighbouring tribe and scalping their kids, and his missus asks, How was your day, darling? You won't believe it, love. I just got all these smallpox infested blankets and a bag of marbles and the stupid fuck only wanted the land rights to North Dakota. What an idiot. I guess absolute respect to the savages on North Sentinel Island. They know how to do it. They made it very clear the visitors could stick their baubles and peace offerings straight up their asses, along with a few well placed spears and arrows. I'm pretty sure these guys worship the ancient jungle god of fuck around and find out because they immediately try and kill anyone who lands on their beach. They even shoot arrows at passing planes and drones. The Indian government even made the island a no-go area. Anyway, if there are two important takeaways from all of this. It's one, some woke tit will try and get this game cancelled at some point 
by accusing it of being an analogue of colonialism. You heard it here first. And two, if you value your land, shoot at anyone that arrives on the beach and don't accept free blankets from strangers. The general enemy design is literally fantastic. The enemies broadly break down into two camps, cannibals and mutants. Both groups field enemy types that scale in damage, durability and abilities. Cannibals start out as vaguely curious peons who initially show up and gawk at you, only becoming violent when attacked or approached too closely. Unfortunately, probably because you're the only civilised western person in the area, your mere presence is sufficiently antagonising for them that they will eventually attack, even if you don't attack first. Even the act of defending yourself will be perceived by these savages as an affront and only further fuel their aggression. It's like being Kyle Rittenhouse, basically. As your relationship with the cannibals in your local area accelerates into an increasingly antagonistic self fueling decline, they send worse and worse enemies at you. Soon you'll be having giants turn up and these psychotic, acrobatic chicks with fist daggers and a host of other weirdos. Some are fast, some are strong, some can throw spears at you and some are capable of flipping over walls and obstructions, so you had better work on those base defences and get to an elevated position at least two storeys off the ground. And yeah, remember this, some enemies, cannibal or otherwise, can get over walls. Spiked log walls will keep the basic bitches out for a while, but eventually you'll have to work on your medieval defence game because later enemies will be hurling themselves as high as your second floor. The mutants have a similar diverse selection of types. I would not call any of them particularly benign, but some are vastly worse than others. Some are primarily annoying because Kelvin usually runs to the hills the second he spots any mutant, so they can significantly interrupt your resource gathering, which can be catastrophic in time critical situations where you're trying to throw up a base before nightfall. If I had my way, I would dock his wages for that, but sadly he's working for free. Other enemies are downright lethal. One type moves swiftly and in a pack and can literally bum rush you out of the bushes and batter you off the cliff before you even know what's going on. Another type has spiked hands and can do flip attacks that will hit you in the chops if you're standing too close to a window, gawping out at the action. Now factor in that mutants can randomly show up pretty much anywhere, but seem at least to be more prevalent during the cold seasons. The cannibals, whilst being naturally more numerous around their bases, have patrol routes, so you can face plant into one just due to bad luck. Now add to this, once a single cannibal has shown up at your base, he's going to come back, and he's probably coming back with his friends. And even if you kill the scout, his friends are going to come back looking for their missing bestie. You can delay the inevitable, but sooner or later, however you play it, eventually you're going to be smacking National Geographic tits in the face with an axe and then chowing down on her family and friends. So it's not all bad. One last factor worth mentioning is this. Now I don't know if this is science fact or merely confirmation bias, but the enemy AI certainly seems to have got better at negotiating successful routes around my traps. I swear that when I first started playing this game in early access, a right angle bend in my defences was sufficient to confuse their pathing and see them face plant into the many delicious punji spikes. But as of writing this, I'm seeing enemies, particularly mutants, run straight around the barricades and up to the front door. I've even seen an enemy sidestep a trap on the ground twice. This has led to an evolving arms race between me and the locals and as every red-blooded Ronald Reagan fan knows, everyone loves a good arms race. So yeah, I'm not sure how much of this is my imagination and how much is AI, but err on the side of caution and make sure that the primary way into your base has a lot of nice surprises for the uninvited guests. There is lore that threads through both this and the previous game but I don't think my enjoyment of this game was in any way impacted by not having played the forest. Although, this being said, 
I probably will go back at some point and play the forest, just for the experience. Sadly, I discovered that I own the forest and it's been sitting in my Steam library gathering dust since I must have snaffled it up in some random Steam sale long since forgotten. If you do play this game without playing the first, I would suggest watching a lore guide on YouTube of the first game just to get a feel for what's going on. It's not exactly a Tolkien saga, but there is story here and it adds a lot of flavour. Even though the final release is out, I'm sure more content will come, especially given the amount of new stuff they put in the launch day build. But, in my very humble opinion, there are a few things that they could consider including. 1. Signs We need signs. For flavour, humour, and especially online multiplayer. 2. A small boat or canoe. 3. A more pronounced bleed effect. 4. An auto run key. 5. An unfuck Kelvin key. I appreciate why a boat might be a little problematic because I don't know how far out the sea goes, but personally I would love a little raft for circumnavigating the island. It would also really amplify the feeling of being in the interior and not being in the interior. And yes, Kelvin needs a fix button for when he gets badly stuck. Maybe just to teleport him to the player's location, or some such utility for when he gets stuck in a lake for three days. The holy trinity of Sons of the Forest is currently a bit unreliable given the current bugs. When everything is working fine with this game, your little powerhouse of building, foraging and exploring goes something like this. The player is essentially the brains of the operation. Yes, it is duly noted that in my case, this is a fairly generous description, but bear with me. The player is the leader, Kelvin is the labour, and Virginia is the sentry. The player runs around doing their building and exploring stuff, whilst Kelvin plods along gathering resources for you, and Virginia, once fully upgraded with a pistol and a shotgun, serves as Overwatch. A mobile sentry turret, if you will. Eventually, when issued upgraded weapons, she becomes the Death Star hovering over your shoulder. This trifecta is a core dynamic of the game, and when carefully managed, massively increases the efficiency and effectiveness of the player. But here is the rub. Virginia has a bit of a habit of getting the zoomies and then fucking off into the woods for half a day. Even on a good day, sometimes she just sits there with a glazed look on her face whilst you're being attacked. But the biggest problem is that she just sometimes vanishes. And Kelvin, poor brain damaged Kelvin, might get stuck at one of your bases, or stuck in a lake, or stuck endlessly running against a drying rack. Suddenly your trifecta goes to shit. Your sentry guard is AWOL, Kelvin is rendered useless, and you're on your jack shit, all alone, doing all of the work, and having to watch your own back as you do it. Now if this wasn't bad enough, Kelvin can and does, if you are very unlucky, get stuck permanently. At one point, I almost had to abandon my current playthrough, because Kelvin got stuck in the sea, 20 metres off the coast, and there was nothing I could do to get him to shift. And this would have been my second playthrough in a row that I'd had to abandon, because last time I got stuck into a new game without knowing that the respawning loot container's default setting had been reversed. Now, this was a massage that fortunately had a happy-ish ending. Being the king of cheese that I am, I eventually worked out that if I very gently bashed Kelvin in the fucking head with a war club, then when he fell over, I revived him whilst walking into him, and I rinsed and repeated this process many, many times. Eventually, I could shuffle him back onto the beach, inch by inch. Now, obviously, gently is a subjective term when you're clubbing someone almost to death. and He was certainly pissed off and non-cooperative for a time, but in the long run, it was a win all round. And besides... He already had his head stoved in beyond repair, so who gives a shit about a few more hematomas? But it should not have taken me several game sessions, 
multiple in-game days, multiple trips around the map, extensive research and experimentation, and then bashing the poor fuck in the head 50 to 100 times, just so I could unbreak my playthrough. Totally not bitter about this. And this all brings me to the rather sad conclusion that Sons of the Forest is a flawed masterpiece. Now I wanted to just call it an out and out masterpiece, but I can't in good conscience say that until a few critical, long-standing issues with the game have been fixed. Kelvin getting perma-stuck being the most significant. Love this game as I do. In a game where you might spend days building a base, it is frankly unforgivable that your entire playthrough might get screwed because of a few easy to correct flaws in the game. If Kelvin had a setting so you could recall him or reset him to a location, your playthrough would not be ruined if he got stuck in a lake or out at sea. And on top of this, this now makes me very cautious about building on the coast, because I'm worried he'll get stuck again. And, as I said, if you could change all the damn settings from the option screen without some of them being hard-baked into the playthrough data file, you wouldn't have to abort an entire playthrough because of some niggling setting you forgot to change three days earlier. These are relatively small issues, that have a huge impact on the game, and if you're forewarned about them you'll most likely be able to avoid them, but they only require tiny changes to entirely fix. So why the fuck is it 2024 and people are still having to look up guide videos on editing your game files and hitting forums asking, how do I unstick Kelvin? Because the stupid fucktard is stuck in the water again. Chop fucking chop, nice developers. You have your mission should you wish to accept it, or feel compelled by common sense and the desire not to self-sabotage a game that could very literally get a perfect 10 out of 10 score from me with just a few changes. All this being griped on the subject of changes, this game does not appear to have a significant bleed effect. Now I might be mistaken about this, but even if I am, not by much. Sometimes I nail some enemy with six stone arrows and they're still flailing around doing their weird tribal mojo shit. It all certainly seems to be pretty much direct damage as far as I can see, unless of course you hit them with poison or fire, but that's not my point. Now I've seen some enemies apparently expiring over time, but mainly it appears from an explosion. But I really think they need more substantial damage over time mechanics in this game because if they exist, they are subtle enough that I can't really spot them. I think there should come a point where an enemy with a couple of spears trailing out of their back and a whole bunch of arrow holes in his or her balls, it's 2024 after all, should start to obviously bleed out and expire. The combat becomes a trifle silly when your enemy has taken on the appearance of a fucking porcupine with the amount of weapons sticking out of it, but it's still standing there, not dying, giving you the stink eye. As I said at the start, I never played the first game, and I know some people have quite strong opinions about which is better, which one they prefer, whether it's a worthy sequel, and feelings run deep. I heard one comment that he much preferred the map on the old game, and that they thought some of the functionality was better before. And what can I say really? I never played the original, so I'm sure I've triggered somebody, but I can only speak how I find. I'm sure a comparison between the games is a video right there. I just wanted to acknowledge that I know there is a tight community surrounding this franchise, and most of them probably know far more about the game than me. So don't get too triggered, please. 21 kilotons ultimate advice for new players. The following tip should serve any new player well, whatever their playstyle. After landing, if you don't have a plan or you have no idea what to do next, then immediately build a shack and set up spike traps. Elevation is your friend. Simply being three stories off the ground will save you from a lot of pain. Enemies might be able to run through unlocked doors and into buildings, but they cannot currently climb ropes 
or shimmy across single log rails. Use this to your advantage. But always expect the worst, because if there is a way for them to get in, they will find it. Also, neither cannibals nor mutants can swim, and both seem positively hydrophobic. When all else fails, jump in the lake or run into the sea. Tread water until you come up with a plan. Use this fact, it's especially useful if you're travelling around the coast or just need to immediately get somewhere safe. Always, and I mean absolutely always, carry at least one emergency blanket and a stick, so you can save your game on the fly. Stockpile before going into caves and bunkers. It might be a small ice cave with some free shit, and that's hilarious. It might be a large cave network with lots of nice loots, protected by lots of nasty enemies. If you're going underground, make sure you are stocked up on food, water, armour, weaponry, sticks, rocks, cloth, and whatever else you usually rely on to turn your frown upside down. As with any game like this, there is much discussion and debate about the alleged perfect base location. It is, however, slightly more nuanced than that. Setting aside the fact that any location has to be a location that's useful, because building a perfect base on the farthest corner of the map, in the middle of nowhere, is fuck all use to anyone. Ideally, your forever home slash cannibal love nest will have immediate on-site access to a list of resources that you need or want on tap. This is further complicated by the fact that seasons change critical environmental features. That base you built on the island might be ideal in summer, but in winter the lake will freeze and the enemies will just jog across the ice and stick a bone tomahawk in your fucking eye. That water source you rely on might freeze solid in winter, so you need a location with running water so it's accessible all year round. You preferably want to be near lootable sources of cloth, rope and other goodies, subject to your game settings. Following from this, you need access to alternative food sources, to fish, which magically vanish in winter. I don't know, perhaps they're hibernating because they're tired. A coastal base is wonderful, and you can catch seagulls and eat them when the fish dry up in winter, but unless that base is right next to a river outlet to the coast, you're going to be pretty thirsty when the rain collectors stop working, when they freeze solid. So where am I going here? I have yet to find a single, perfect location that has absolutely everything that I need in one spot. I've come close, but not nailed this problem yet. I did, however, come up with a relatively elegant, albeit time-consuming solution, subject to getting hold of the zipline. This involved a bit of a grind and building a few towers so I could zipline from base to base instantly without touching the forest floor. But building a base here and here allowed me access to an almost unlimited supply of food, water, electricals, building materials, cloth, 3D, printer, ink, and MREs. And I like MREs. Build a couple of quick zip lines to access a cannibal base and the entrance to this cave, and I even had resupplies of the scarce rifle ammunition and materials for upgrading my weapons. Combine that with the regular cannibal attacks, and I was provided with regular roasty, toasty forearm surprise, and I was absolutely golden. Naturally, unlike so many well-made survival games, if you set up your defences correctly and robustly, you can turn your problems into opportunities, and every enemy attack can become a free loot dump, instead of something to be scared of. As I said earlier, when cannibals turn up and attack my base, it's basically the dinner bell. All this being said, to quote some sage advice I was once given myself, make it work. Most locations can be turned into a serviceable base if you use the terrain, exploit the local resources, and do a little improvisation. Lastly, use your bloody ears. Too frequently in this game you will be merrily chopping down trees or collecting twigs and fucking berries, and out of nowhere something horrible will jump out of the bushes right on your position. I'm talking apocalypse now, do not get off the boat levels of pants shitting. 
often the only warning any of these guys are going to give you will be an audible cue. A low moaning, a squawk from a cannibal, clicking, or the noise of something skittering across the ground. Don't wait for confirmation, immediately flee to your lumbar panic room, elevated position, or just jump into the nearest body of water and wait and see. The thing is, you can actually find ghetto blasters scattered around the island, and you can carry them around and even set them up inside your base, giving you a permanent audio beacon, and you get to listen to the game's rather amusing and iconic soundtrack. But personally, I would not bother with that shit, because you are basically just drowning out the sound of your approaching enemies. As fun as it is to watch Virginia do her little party dance. Turn problems into opportunities. Like any good survival game with a bit of experience and understanding of the game, quickly you will discover that many of the challenges in the game can be readily exploited to your advantage. You will eventually be under regular attack from cannibals and mutants, so get your passive base defences up to speed quickly. Then you can just sit there in your armchair, made of human bones, watching the idiot meat wave attacks die on your spike traps. Then just run out and hoover up the loots. Some mutants can be skinned for valuable armour patches, and the cannibals can drop their little skin pouches with useful shit in them. I used to worry about those annoying seagulls that kept swooping on my food drying racks until I realised that with a bit of practice, I could easily swap them with my tomahawk, grab the feathers and gut them for food. Many problems can be turned to your advantage. Or at least you get some free severed heads to make ornamental house decorations, and you can smile at that instead. Speed is armour. If you are well fed, well rested, with a few fishes in your bag, it's ideally summer and you're sporting a can-do attitude, it is actually amazing how far you can traverse the map if you are on the move and just YOLO very, very quickly from point A to point B. Just keep moving fast, evade or run from enemies, only stop long enough to grab the odd berry off a bush or take a quick gulp of water from a passing water source, but just don't stop and don't hang around. If you get up early and run like the fucking clappers and use your bloody map, you can run point to point in a day across more than half the map. If you goof around, stop to make a little fire and cook some raccoon and generally fuck around, you will most likely find out. Speed is armour and it's actually surprising how quickly you can traverse the map if you stick to the plan and burn that shoe leather non-stop. Illumination is your friend. Setting aside the fact that N Knight likes darkness in every situation, whether you're in caves or in your base at night, illumination is a survival mechanic in this game in the same way that food hydration and warmth is. I appreciate that early game materials like cloth are valuable and scarce, and depending on your own personal difficulty settings, light bulbs and solar panels might be scarce and finite. But Jesus Christ, lighting up your base like a Christmas tree and extending that illumination outwards beyond your walls, well that shit is simply priceless. There is a reason why Coldits, concentration camps and military bases all have spotlights. It's not just about who's getting out, it's about making sure your perimeter is secure. Trust me. Survival is all about fresh flowing water. The single most important factor I consider when building a base is its proximity to flowing water. That does not freeze in winter. If you build a base over the top of a creek, you can have access to flowing water without even going outside like a little private bathroom in the basement. Then build passive defences around your perimeter like spike traps, then subject to your willingness to participate in a little bit of cannibalism, you can shelter in place indefinitely. Enemies will attack your base, die on your passive defences, you can loot them for supply pouches, armour pouches and snaffle up their limbs for food. And then you can go down to the basement to have a little drink. Because you built on top of flowing water, you can also set up fish traps in the basement, which will admittedly not work in winter, but with dryers and hard work you can stockpile for that. The important part of this entire thing is, 
if you build a base, however good it is, even if there is a nearby pool, in winter the pool will freeze, and you will have no water and no fish. So your theoretically perfect base isolates you in a position where every day you have to head out on a little trek to get water from the nearest flowing stream. There is zero point building a base in a location where you have to go walkies every day to get water. That's like building a supermarket on an island where there's no customers. There is a reason why most towns and cities have rivers flowing through the middle of them. It's because even ancient club wielding maniacs in 5000 BC realised that walking 10 miles every day to get the water for your caramel latte was a massive pain in the arse. On this note, if you find a hot springs in the mountains, take careful note of its location. They are basically the only place where pools of water will stay unfrozen and drinkable during winter. So if you're up in the mountains, build on a stream or build on a hot springs. Otherwise, the base will turn into a bit of a chore. Well, I guess it's time we slung these limbs on the fire and settled down for supper. Now yes, I am not so close-minded and morally destitute that I fail to appreciate that some people might find the extreme violence, brutality, cannibalism and graphic horror of this game somewhat problematic. But my counterpoint to that is that these sorts of people are probably snowflakes and weak. Besides, this game is funny. Sons of the Forest is a game where you will be casually pootling around outside your base, jabbing mutant babies with a spear, whilst you wait for a couple of severed legs to finish cooking on the fire. It's a game where you kill pregnant women with National Geographic tits, kill their kids, and then eat their significant cannibal others. It's a game full of horrors, but it's full of beauty too. Seriously. This game is going to mean different things to different people. If you are profoundly affected by horror atmospherics, then this will be a terrifying and immersive experience. If you are a jaded gamer on par with that hairy dude from South Park, and you perceive this game exclusively through the lens of game mechanics, and the Cthulhu-esque horror does not even impinge on your consciousness because you are that psychologically numbed, then maybe this game might not really appeal to you, and you don't find it frightening at all. Personally, I almost shat myself playing this game, so I'm all in. My cautionary warning to potential players is, if you're the sort of person who likes to quickly cap the main questline, such as it is, then quickly move on, you might not find enough depth in Sons of the Forest. Because a lot of the depth is what you do between the dungeon diving. In my humble opinion, the survival, exploration and domination of the island was a massive aspect of the game for me. As I've warned before, I'm one of the strange fellas that liked base building in Fallout 4. That, combined with the fact that I love Valheim and base building in that game, should tell you everything you need to know about me. After hammering this game, I am forced to issue the following statement. Sons of the Forest is a flawed masterpiece. But nevertheless, it's a masterpiece. Change my mind. It is the most anti-ESG compliant game I have seen in as long as I can remember. It's interesting, exciting and frightening in equal measures. The combination of difficulty modes and the extensive gameplay settings allow you to modify the game to precisely your preferred style of play. They have created a beautiful, terrifying and unique world. You can murder pregnant ladies with a fire axe and eat their friends. You can decorate your crib with human skulls. Chuck Norris used to ride around in an ice cream van decorated with human skulls. And whilst you don't get an ice cream van in Sons of the Forest, at least you can decorate your house with them. Sure. Some aspects of the game might seem a little unsavoury for a modern audience. Killing mutant babies, engaging in cannibalism, or even worse, eating shellfish. But it's all done very tastefully and with creative vision. Frankly, what is there not to like? 
Sons of the Forest's full release is available on Steam for PC, with plans in the pipeline for eventual console release in the future. It's currently retailing in the UK at £24.99, suitable for children aged 5 to 11. But for now, good luck and happy hunting. Thank you.